This is the Practically Culture Spoiler Cast, a podcast to, devoted to diving deeper on the TV and movies, maybe sometimes the video games that we and you are into. I'm your host, Logan Bow, podcasting today from Lehigh, Utah, and I'm joined by the one, the only Bob Caswell in the Bay Area. How are you, Bob? Hey, doing, doing well. How's it going with you? Just hanging out. You know me. Nice. This week we spoil Black Klansmen, and we'll also talk about what we're consuming and even make a top five or so list by the end. If you like what you hear, look for us in your usual podcast app and at practicalculture.com. We recommend you to check it out at the end of the show. We're spoiling TV, movies, probably sometimes video games. It's the Practically Culture Spoiler Cast. Let's rock. Oh, man, it is good to be back, Bob. We're still rolling along here. Episode three, still happening. Yeah, yeah. It's, you know, when you do something three times, then it's for real and it's going to last forever. That's what they say, or that's what I'm saying. I don't know. <laughs> All right, good enough for me. Um, and uh, before we get into the spoiling, as always, let's chat a bit about what we're watching or playing. And I'll even go first. Okay. It's a little anticlimactic. As I mentioned at the top, I've moved again and I'm living in Lehigh. Uh, and I've been spending a lot of the week handling that. So I'm a little behind on my watching. But I'm so close on succession. Unfortunately, I'm still a couple episodes away. Um, and I will just say I have, as threatened, put a couple of hours into World of Warcraft. But okay, I'm my very casual approach, which is the only way I can make <laughs> it work long term. Like I think I'm up to like little six of the 10 levels you have to level up this expansion normally by this time a week into it i would have had like three or four characters all the way up to 120 so yeah it's significantly less of a time investment than i'm used to playing and we'll see if it's sustainable good well i'm glad to hear that it's not getting in the way too much and uh yeah so so what else are you watching or uh kind of what else is in the queue i mean succession is a big one you definitely want to finish that one up first for sure uh, like I say, I mean, I've caught up a tiny bit on, um, uh, on some old shows, like watched a little bit of Better Call Saul, so I can catch up on that one. Um, a little bit of Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, still auditioning that one. Um, <laughs> auditioning, I love it. <laughs> uh, well, you know, that's sort of... It's kind sort of what you do with it. TV shows, yeah. I <laughs> uh, thought about some, uh, some other things, but didn't watch them. Um, I've had... So one of the things that helps me play a little bit of World of Warcraft is that I can put on like The Bachelorette or Bachelor in Paradise and like sort <laughs> of do half of two things at the same time and uh -huh. convince myself I'm being halfway productive. But, uh, <laughs> but I haven't even done a ton of that. So no, like I say, I've been mostly moving and um, that's really what's been taking most of my time. So it's one of those weeks. But what, do you, what have you been uh, looking at, Bob? Well, I'm still playing We Happy Few, which is something I'd like to review eventually, this uh, dystopian alternate uh, history game uh, set in 1960s England. And then I also started playing, um, and this is me trying to convince myself that I can play two games at once, which sometimes works and sometimes doesn't. I also started playing the latest uh, Far Cry expansion. Mm -hmm. um, but honestly, I'm just stalling because gaming season gets underway really in September with a bunch of huge releases that then make it so I have no time through the fall and into the holidays. Um, other than that, I haven't, uh, I finished Succession and I'm excited to talk about it, but I haven't really started, I'm still auditioning Sharp Objects with Amy Adams. I haven't like committed to anything <laughs> beyond these kind of placeholder games that are, I shouldn't say it so, like they're so much lower on the list, but you know, Red Dead Redemption, um, Stuff like that, Red Dead Redemption 2, that's where the real commitment is going to come into play, and that's a bit later. So we'll see. Excellent. All right. Well, you know, it happens. Succession is probably looking like it's going to be on the, the list for next time because I'm sure I'll get there, and we don't want it to go too long before we spoil it for the people. <laughs> that's right. Anyway, uh, ready to get to this? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, Black Klansman. Here's my synopsis. An African-American police officer from Colorado successfully manages to infiltrate the local Ku Klux Klan with the help of a white surrogate. And um, I just left this from IMDb, but I, I feel like since we're spoiling it, I, I'm not a fan of this next phrase. Okay. Uh, and he eventually becomes head of the local branch. Now, since we're spoiling, I thought there was some talk about that, but he never actually became head of the local KKK branch. Am I right? You're right. Yeah, they really wanted him to become head, but then he was sort of stalling and other things happened in the plot that made it so it was a moot point anyway. So I'm not sure that it's 
it's actually accurate. That is true. Yep. So um, anti-spoiler from uh, IMDb. Right. Anyway, uh, to continue my intro, it's starring John David Washington, Adam Driver, Lara Harrier, and has a lot of other interesting people. Directed by Spike Lee, written by Charlie Wachtel, David Rabinowitz, Kevin Wilmot, and Spike Lee, based on the biography written by Ron Stallworth himself. Um, what did you think, Bob? So uh, I quite enjoyed this movie and I do recommend it and I do like it. You know, it's, it's captivating. It has um, a bit of a history lesson, but that's not its primary purpose. So it's, it doesn't, it doesn't feel homeworky, but you do feel like you've gotten some credit for finishing some homework. I want to say <laughs> even after you've watched it, but, but uh, you didn't realize that you did some. Um, yeah, so it's an it's a easy recommend for me, and it's a a, a like slash really like, I guess you could say. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. <laughs> yeah, uh, I I feel pretty similarly. Um, it's a movie that uh, does touch on a lot of political themes, mm. makes political statements, but um, maybe controversially, he puts the enjoyableness of the movie first. Spike Lee does. Yeah, and so it doesn't feel like I'm eating vegetables. Uh, feels like a movie I liked, even though, um, as we will talk about, he uh, maybe sometimes gets into a little bit of trouble from certain people for uh, going movie first, um, accurate history second. But I, I'd recommend for me, it's a good movie if you just look at the movie. Yeah, same here. Um, I don't have uh, political stakes, at least I, I don't think I do in, the, in this context. I, I, I just want it to be a good movie. And if uh, it, it has a good message or makes me think, from a political perspective, um, I don't think anything was uh, done inappropriately. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> All right. And so, you know, I looked into the, uh, the credited writers, because there's four of them, uh, and there's actually not a lot of track record here. Wachtel and Rabinowitz, this is their first feature. They're the first two credited writers. Um, Kevin Wilmot has written a couple things, even though I didn't know a lot of them. He did co-write Chirac with Spike Lee, which is Spike Lee's last, was it last year, I think. Hmm. Um, but one of Wilmot's credits is a movie about if the South had won the Civil War, and another is a movie. Get this, Bob is a movie about a basketball player named Joseph Smith, who earns the nickname the Prophet, as in profiting financially, which just <laughs> seems like oddly coincidental for there to be no Mormon influences to that thing. So maybe I wonder if there are Mormon influences. I don't yeah. Know. Wow. What's going on there? That's that's an intriguing one. <laughs> uh, but uh, anyway, and then Spike Lee, he usually gets a writing credit on a lot of his movies. Um, so yeah, anyway, that was a little bit about the writers. But I actually thought that the, you know, even though there's a written by committee thing going on um, without any huge veterans necessarily, I thought the writing was totally fine. It was good. Yeah, uh, me too. I, I, I was almost surprised, in fact, because I was worried um, that it would be too heavy handed or political, or like you said, you get too many writers and then it's just a decision by committee. That doesn't seem to be a problem. This could be, this could be nominated for like adapted screenplay almost, um, or maybe not almost, maybe it should be, I, it's early in the year, but I, I'm saying it's, it's, it's not an issue and it's on that level that I could, I could see it being in that category potentially. Yeah. So, I mean, we are spoilers, so we can definitely get into the plot, but, um, uh, so what are we saying? So Ron Stallworth, he's hired as like a black detective in, uh, in the Colorado Springs uh, Police Department. And actually one of my favorite scenes, maybe one of my favorite scenes of the year was when he's auditioning or applying for the job. Interviewing, I guess, is the, is the word I should probably use. Um, and like the police chief and some politician, they're like giving him a hard time, razzing him um, and asking if he really thinks he can handle it. And uh, I really like that scene. We even get the guy who plays... Uh, one guy in the, in the in the wire who says shit, and he says that, that same <laughs> thing again, which was sort of a little Easter egg. I feel like to fans of the wire, um, but I thought it was a good scene when he's when he's there. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, this is set in the early 1970s, so you know, hindsight is 2020, and and you can get all like uh, offended and start identifying villains pretty early on. But most of the characters here. Are, are like light racist, you know, <laughs> like they're, they're, it's just the time and place is such that these are legitimate questions. Like, what are you going to do when somebody calls you this name or uh, treats you this way, which isn't fair, but I'm asking you this question because you can't have a reaction like a white person can. 
um, if they were in the similar situation. And so it, it does do a good job of um, kind of right away starting with that, with that context of like, okay, this is the early 1970s, but it also doesn't make it so like everyone's an overt racist. Most of them are just normal people trying to live life. I mean, there are, we're going to get to the KKK in a minute, but there, there are really racist people in this movie, but I like the way that most of the characters, that's not the first thing about them necessarily, even though it's part of the essence, the aura in the time and place that we're talking about. And there are some cops, one in particular, who is definitely big time oh, yeah. racist. Oh yeah, big time. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so it's not just the KKK, and that, that, I'm sure that was part of it. Uh, anyway, so as he rises up the ranks, uh, Ron Stallworth, he is sort of given one assignment, which is to infiltrate the Black Student Union at the local university, just mm-hmm. to see what's going on there. And then shortly after, he sort of finds his own way, according to the movie, into um, makes his own way into an assignment of infiltrating the KKK. And so Mm -hmm. he's doing both of these simultaneously. Um, And of course in the movie, uh, one of the main things is he's certainly more drawn and more sympathetic to the, the black student union for, you know, a lot of reasons because he is black for one. And certainly if we as movie watchers, we're going to be more drawn to the Black Student Union or the KKK. We're probably naturally more sympathetic to the, the Black Student Union. So the sure. movie leans into that. Um, and as the movie goes on, he sort of uses both of those affiliations and infiltrations to um, to protect the Black Student Union a little bit more, even if it gets a little complicated. But the reason I want to bring that up and, and dwell on it a little bit mm-hmm. is that... Um, Boots Riley, of all people, who made Sorry to Bother You, which we spoiled last week, he actually recently tweeted out this major commentary on Black Klansmen, criticizing the politics of it. Uh Uh-oh. And a big focus of it was that dual infiltration that I just talked about. Um, So just to to mention it a little bit, to get into it a bit, um, here are some of the the, the bullet points of what Boots Riley said. It was actually pretty long. It's like this Word document, three pages of it, and he like, tweeted screenshots of it <laughs> okay okay that's one way to do it so you get out get away with like tweeting long things on uh, on twitter i suppose um but he says boots riley that it, that he, that uh, even though the movie is based on the ron stallworth biography we need to be aware that that stallworth himself paints a much rosier picture of himself than what actually happened i guess we've had for you oh. things like that and gotten the official documents and reports from the police and then various things so we can sort of fact check i guess uh, the stallworth biography and what he says is stallworth did infiltrate the radical black organization and i haven't fact checked this boots riley fact checks but i'm just putting it out there what his criticism was um and he was actually there for three years uh infiltrating the the black student union and but but what he did his assignment was to actually undermine its effectiveness he like would uh, set people up to be arrested or killed um, and he would thwart their efforts, cause infighting, things like that. Uh, and on the other hand, when he infiltrated the white supremacist organization, it wasn't to disrupt those. It was really to use those guys to thwart the, the uh, black student union. Wow. So all of a sudden that gets a little dicier in terms of how much of a hero we can call uh, Ron Stallworth. If, um, you know, if that's true and probably is, I guess, I don't know. Um, but there's no bombing, like at the end that Stallworth helped thwart. They didn't trick a bad cop at the end. Uh, and also Flip, who infiltrated the KKA, KKK, he wasn't Jewish, nor did he look Jewish in any way. Um, so that wasn't like a subplot at all to the real story. Uh, I guess the point being, um, this movie goes sort of out of its way to say untrue things that make the cops look better than they were. And he finds that objectionable because it does things to undermine movements like Black Lives Matter today. So I just feel like, whoa, mom and dad are fighting a little bit here. I don't want to pick a side. <laughs> you really try to avoid politics on this show. And this seems thornier than most political takes. So I'm not going to take a side. But I just, since one of the things I like to do on the spoiler cast is, is throw out the context so you know what conversation is being had about the movie. This is something that just sort of flew out there in the last couple of days. And, yeah. Uh, it's happening. Wow. I had no idea the extent of that d- d- difference between reality and the, the movie's artistic liberties. And, you know, now mom and dad are fighting, like you said. 
Um, I will say at the beginning of the movie, Spike Lee does, does kind of a comic-y way of saying it's based on tr- a true events or a true story. It's like <laughs> based on some crazy shit or what did he say? I should have written for it For real down. shit, for real or something like <laughs> yeah. that, right? And for real, know, for real shit. <laughs> on the one hand, it, it was effective because it was funny because I know what he was going for, you know, saying like, I'm going to take some liberties here, but I'm also playfully using my people's way of saying things like that, which it, it was effective. But on the other hand, based on everything you just said, um, I want to say that maybe he could have nipped this in the bud by just excluding that altogether or saying something. I've seen it in other movies where you say something like um, inspired, inspired by, by or yeah. I mean, it's a weird uh, pedantic sort of thing to get into, but based on, on Boots Riley's reaction and, and what I'm hearing now, I could see how that's a, that's a little problematic because it does paint quite a different picture. And the movie, which we're going to get into, is effective at showing some drama involving racism, but it's definitely not anything near the problems that Boots Riley identified in his expose that you just mentioned, because those things weren't issues at all in the movie. Um, so I don't know. I, I feel like our, our, our hero in the movie isn't so much conflicted about that kind of stuff. I mean, he does have to deal with um, protecting his girlfriend or, you know, can you help from within or do you want to change the police? You know, there's these broad brush themes that are adjacent, similar to what Boots Riley is getting at, but um, it's still quite a bit of different context there. So I'm not sure what to make of it. That's well, crazy. Well, it's, it's interesting that you point that out because um, – like Boots Riley, I guess, has one take and Spike Lee has a different take on the, on the politics. And we just watched Boots Riley's movie, Sorry to Bother You. And while it gets at some of these themes, it was almost just like so bizarre and in your face that it's like, I don't know what to do with that. And maybe I'll just set that movie aside in the way it affects me. Whereas Spike Lee's movie, I really enjoyed. And I think I'll just take it with me more and think about it more. So even if it's a skim milk version of these themes, they might. I might actually drink the cup. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Or even I'll give Spike Lee even more credit. I think Spike Lee is effective in communicating some complicated themes that have to deal with um, race relations and racism today versus in the past and the history and where things came from. Never mind that he, this is going to be a problematic phrase to use, <laughs> whitewashed uh, some of the, the real happenings. Um, and those maybe should have their own conversation, but if you're looking at it as a movie that's effective in, in um, conveying a certain message that's impactful, uh, it might not be the message that really happened, but it sounds like Boots Riley is more on the side of like, you know, just throw crazy shit at the wall and see what sticks and everybody's confused. Whereas Spike Lee really wanted to hone in on a narrative that um, was cohesive, tightly woven, well-constructed, and he really succeeds at that, notwithstanding the casualty of the reality being of this real situation being sacrificed a little bit in terms of what people know about it. But I'm going to give this one because everyone cares what I think to Spike Lee a little bit because I'm more about the end product of the movie. And I don't know that that history um, issue is as dramatic a problem but then again who am i to say don't listen to me like i'm just saying what works for me (laughs) well yeah i mean we're not qualified to evaluate the activism really i mean we can have our takes but i mean what we hold ourselves out is you know people who talk about movies and in terms of the movie this is a much better movie than sorry to bother you let's just be honest with that (laughs) yeah at least that's how i felt so for whatever that's worth i guess that's that's what we'll say right um so then go back to the movie. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Uh, like, so one of the main things and the interesting things about this movie is that Ron Stallworth is sort of leading this sting against the KKK. And he's the one talking on the phone in another interesting parallel to the Boots Riley movie, Sorry to Bother You. Like, and he says, no, trust me, I can, I can talk like a white person on the phone and they'll never know. And so he does that on the phone and he sends uh, Adam Driver's character, Flip Zimmerman, who in the movie is Jewish, um, to go be the person who meets them, um, you know, in person. And I I need to ask you, Bob, this was obviously not a full on David Cross version of white voice, but um, I felt like 
it was not that convincing. I mean, whatever. If it was only on the phone, it would have been fine, convincing enough. But the fact that he sends Adam Driver in and they spend like one short part of a scene saying, you need to talk like me. And he kind of does, but they sound totally different. And yeah. Go back and forth. I just thought, is this really going to, really going to hold up? Uh, at one point, like Walter, the KKK guy comments that he sounds different. It's just like, Oh, it's just allergies. Okay. Well that, that satisfies me when these people are like really on the lookout for people infiltrating them. And he's just satisfied by them sounding different after one little explanation. I was actually a little, was it it on purpose or was it uh, a gap in the the show's reasoning? I don't know. What did you think? I had a little bit of that problem, but then ironically I Googled it after watching the movie and it turns out that that was fairly accurately based on what really happened. They did use their own voices and tried to work with each other to, to match them. But in, in the in the book version, or at least in the way the history really happened, he did say at one point that he had a cold, but then you can only use that excuse so many times. And they had this extended relationship with each other. So the longer it went on, where especially uh, Adam Driver's character was the in-person, you know, person using his voice a w- way more than, than, you know, the telephone version, it was a little problematic, but I say ironically because I want to say, well, but it happened in real life, Logan, so it's not a problem. <laughs> <laughs> okay i mean i yeah i mean i guess i don't know how you deal with that if it was how it really happened and they they addressed it they mentioned it and they, they just rolled with it and i guess it worked just like that even though <laughs> i was always wondering i have to admit <laughs> yeah it makes you wonder if uh, john david washington maybe could have done a slightly better white voice because unlike sorry to bother you the white voices here well it's just the one really um i think it's just him it's not like they're doing a a a gimmick and getting a different actor to do the voice right so well i don't need his white voice to be better i could buy that that was a voice of a white person it's just, you just need it when to you're match. going back and forth to yeah. people are going to sound different well let me be clear i don't i don't want it to be it's not better is the wrong word but just more matchy or more like yeah maybe right it needed to match more adam driver's voice and adam driver has maybe we just know him too well like his voice is pretty unique so that's a hard one to get just right especially for a black dude, I'm assuming it's probably the same thing for me to like pull off Samuel L. Jackson or something. It's like, wow, that's, that's asking a lot. I mean, maybe probably, but I'm just saying any two people, once you sure. go back and forth and you talk to them that much, you're just going to notice a difference. You're just going to notice it. Yeah. Cause you notice different people on the phone. Oh, I know this person automatically from the first word they say on the phone. Yeah. And you can't perpetually have a cold um, for like months. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, all right, moving on from that. <laughs> uh, but you also talked about Adam Driver, who's very Adam Drivery, and he is an mm-hmm. unusual actor in a lot of ways. Uh, and I feel like we've been fans of his ever since we saw him in Girls. But uh, yeah. I just, I'm just impressed that it always works somehow. He feels authentic, I guess. I, I don't know. But maybe like not 100% authentic, but that lack of polish makes him feel even more authentic. I can't really describe Adam Driver, but I'm a fan, and I'm glad he's continued to get big parts. Um, and I, I'm liking him. Yeah, there's some part of him that feels like he's the same in every movie, but then then I think about it, and I'm like, but that actually works because the characters he plays, he draws out of himself the, the best parts of himself for that character, and uh, if you think about it, even you know Meryl Streep, you could argue is the same, and you know, there's a certain part of her that's the same in every movie too. But anyway, I, I think Adam Driver's up and coming, or he's already he maybe he's already arrived. I mean, Kylo Ren's a pretty big, yeah, character. that's a good point. Um, but he's showing some range, and I and I think he fits the role here, and he plays with um, the the conflicts he's given quite well, and and I follow him pretty in a pretty believable way. I thought it worked pretty well. So one of the things that happens eventually as they do this sting operation is that um, they. Uh, Which they start talking, yeah, the two, the Ron Stallworth, the uh, fictional Ron Stallworth, yeah. um, ends up developing a relationship with David Duke, of all people, um, played by Topher Grace. And that's just another just unusual performance in, in that I can imagine uh, or that I can remember seeing in film because... He actually seems just like a charming, regular, like sympathetic guy. If if you just go scene by scene with David Duke, and then he'll just say these ridiculously offensive things, like "Oh yeah, I don't like him." But it's one of the best acting and writing and directing like culminations of of making a terrible person seem sympathetic in a way. I just really loved that performance. 
I did too. And it's not like we need David Duke to be sympathetic, but we also don't need him to be like a wahaha villain either. And Spike Lee just lets him be who he is, the way he's written, and it's based on the real person, obviously, and the way he, it's performed by Topher Grace. You know that he's kind of got some batshit crazy ideas and he's kind of on the wrong team. Not kind of, he's... <laughs> <laughs> but there's some humanity underlying there. There's, some, there's something going on there that he's, got, he's, he's con- internally consistent with himself. I, it's hard to describe without making it seem like I'm sympathetic towards David Duke and that's not what I want to do. But I really liked how it wasn't a caricature. It seemed like he got his full screen time to just be the creepy guy that he is um but in a way that is almost sympathetic <laughs> yeah well i think that i think that's the uh the feat of movie making that i'm trying to to point out and uh, and compliment that to make it so it's not just complete disgust 100 percent of the time i just right. think it's just a delicious thing to to watch and experience in the movie theater for sure so you know we get to some to a couple climaxes i guess one of them and to, as a as a point to uh to talk a little bit more um, I guess we talked about how there are maybe some criticisms of Spike Lee's political activism in this movie. But one of the things that I did think was really cool was the way he um, played on movies and their cultural impact. Because like the very beginning, we've got like a Gone with the Wind scene, which is looks pretty racist at this point. Um, and then we also have another like meeting of the KKK people and they're watching Birth of a Nation, which... Um, I guess it was in like the teens or something it was, it was made, but in the history of cinema, it did a lot of things to influence how movies were made. And then it did a lot of things to influence how culture happened because it really was very instrumental in like a second rebirth of the KKK. And so we see the KKK being influenced by it. Um, and we also just have these, at least or these two movies, these two cinematic um pieces uh, and how they affected the culture that spike lee did bring out as the same time he's making a movie that he hopes might influence the culture and i thought um the you know just using the uh, movie makers toolkit i thought that was actually pretty interesting and poignant yeah i agree i i, I didn't even uh, get both of them quite in the same way I, I i got the birth of a nation one but you're right i forgot about the gone with, uh, gone with the wind that is really intriguing. He, he's and, and this is the best type of movie making too, because it's also not uh, on the nose or he doesn't say it with words or somebody saying something, feeding you what's happening. But if you just see how he inserts these movies into the movie he's making, uh, there's plenty to be said. And I think he did it well. So I, I agree with that. I think that's a, a sharp observation. But it's also just sort of this deliciously repellent uh, scene in the movie where they're just loving yeah. this movie and they're in their full KKK regalia and you're like cringing, but you're drawn to it. somehow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you're like, wow, this was really a thing. The KKK. Well, and we'll get to the ending ending, but for a good portion of the movie, you're like, is this still, is this still think a thing? Do people still act like this this is from the 70s right and part of it is but part of it is made to show that it's still lives on to this day i suppose right (laughs) well that is another interesting thing spike lee certainly throws a few things in the movie that are certainly meant to to resonate with us today like one as we mentioned in the in the main show when we talked about this um i think i actually maybe wrote down exactly what the quote is but um where is it so Oh, I thought I could find. Oh, so um, Stallworth says to a white cop at one point, America would never elect somebody like David Duke president, right? And the cop says, why don't you wake up? And it seems like Spike is trying to say something, whether he's comparing Trump to David Duke or just referencing present day white supremacist groups. I wasn't 100% sure, but it certainly seemed like he was addressing the viewers um, and not necessarily trying to make a plot point. Yeah, yeah, there was kind of a, I took it as a Trump dig. Um, and um, I think it was, on the one hand, it's fine, because it's not like I uh, don't, it's, <laughs> I kind of agree with the assessment in a way. Um, but uh, I, I don't know that it needed to be said in the context of the movie, particularly, but it, it, it's a, it's an interesting addition for sure. But then really, what I want to talk about is the ending ending. But I feel like maybe before we get there, there's the other climax with the car and all that kind of stuff, right? No, we don't have to go in chronological order. If, if the juice is coming up for you, let's do it. So the <laughs> ending is when he puts the footage of the, of the Charlottesville demonstrations and counter demonstrations and the, and the person dying as a, as a result. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, so just before that, we kind of, the movie leaves you on a high because um, our, our hero gets to go undercover against one of the cops that was the real racist asshole that we see earlier being a racist asshole in the movie and, and then gets to bust him and then gets him arrested almost too easily, to be honest. It's a, it's a nice like wrap up, like we're going to end the movie on a high. Um, if we do the right thing, we can rat out the real racists. Of, you know, maybe I'm stretching on how I'm ter- interpreting the. the oh, message. no. I, well, I like where you're going and I hope it's relevant for me to just come in. And yeah, right, go ahead. Right before that, <laughs> you have, uh, Ron Stallworth calling David Duke and uh, and like making fun of him. Like, oh, you really think you could tell a black person on the phone? And then he does the ara. You sure? Just to reference how David Duke said he could always tell. And so yeah, get, like these two zings against the racists, and I don't know if either of those really happened. I guess we we hear from Boots Riley that at least the one didn't happen, but it did feel like it's doing those back slapping high five. Yeah, and you put up with this movie about racists, and here's where we stick it to them. Yeah, I, I did read that uh, David Duke learned about this much much later in life in the 2000s um, that he was duped. Um, so it's not like it is in the movie. But anyway, yeah, there's kind of this uh, stick it to racist moment times two. And I enjoyed it. I, I embraced it too. I was like, you know, making a good point. And then it's kind of ending on this high that uh, you really can solve these problems, even in early 1970s Colorado City or whatever. <laughs> but then it cuts to Charlottesville and some Trump uh rhetoric and footage of uh that young woman getting hit by a car among others at that at that rally and she dies um and then we see you know trump saying his famous lines of like there were bad people on both sides or something ridiculous like that um and i don't know i was i was just taken out of the moment maybe this was on purpose this is what spike lee was going for but i i um wasn't sure if the connection was as direct as he wanted it to be because it's very abrupt and very just like I'm ending on actually it's a shit show and we haven't learned anything and that was just a dramatization just now folks you know here's reality we're totally fucked that's kind of the message I got in a way and I was like huh and then you know credits roll lights in the theater go on or whatever and I'm like okay I have to think about this for both from an impact perspective to me personally, and also just like from a movie making perspective, was that the most effective way to get that message across? Does it really fit? Does it, and I just have all sorts of mixed feelings. I don't know that I'm ready to say therefore X, Y, or Z, but I'm just sort of rambling on how it impacted me and in, in from different angles. Yeah, I, I think that's fair because I think I have an unconventional take on the lessons of that Charlottesville rally myself. Um, and again, I don't want to get too much into politics, but uh, to say simply for me, even though what happened there at Charlottesville is absolute tragedy that someone died. I feel like the lesson is that if white supremacists are poking their head up, it's just amazing how the majority of citizens in this country are like, oh, hell no, that's not happening. To me, it shows progress, even if racism isn't rooted out, obviously. But I suspect that isn't the lesson Spike Lee is trying to, to, to suss out of that, but also he doesn't give us any indication what lesson he's trying to suss out of it so i'm just a little bit like okay i don't know what to do with that right well and that's where i'm maybe reading too much into it but i can't help I, I can't help but do that because that's how movies are but i i feel like he's trying to make the point that uh don't don't kid yourselves we haven't come that far look at this tragic example and i think it was more to the point of president trump actually responding in his poorly uh, worded ways, perhaps more than the actual event, but it was all kind of jumbled together right there at the end. And it just made me feel like, oh, wow. Okay. So this is the point of the movie is that um, in a fictional version of 1970s Colorado City, life is better, even though wink, wink, it's supposed to be worse because it's in the past or something. And, and, and just to help you out, Colorado City is where the uh, polygamists live. We're talking about Colorado Springs. Oh, time. sorry. <laughs> okay, Colorado Springs. <laughs> ah, potato, potato. Problems <laughs> in each of them. <laughs> uh, but, but anyway, um, so here I am kind of uh, rambling on on my lessons learned that I felt like I had learned before that end scene. And now I feel like I'm only sort of half learning because um, – I feel bad because I want to have the movie impact me the way it was intended and, and have it um, 
make me feel something that I otherwise was uneducated about or something, but I, I, I thought the connection was there as much as it was there before I saw it forced into the ending of the movie, if that makes sense. Yeah. Well, I, and I'll just say in general, I, I get a little uneasy when I feel like the politics are, are too heavy handed and maybe indulgent in this case, just because there are a lot of different ways to interpret something politically. And um, I'm not sure that I have the same way. And so I just like, let it, let it be subtle. Let the story speak for itself without you having to break the fourth wall and show us. And I feel like the political message is maybe stronger that way. Yeah. Yep. So here in the end, uh, if we're keeping score, point for Boots Riley and Spike Lee gets, uh, you know, so maybe it evens out. Just kidding. That's not what this is about. But <laughs> uh, Maybe so. So, I mean, we also have some other interesting scenes um, if we're doing the full spoiler cast treatment where uh, David Duke comes to Colorado Springs partly for the initiation of this new fancy Ron Stallworth guy. And it's funny because... Um, the black Ron Stallworth is assigned to be security and then white Ron Stallworth, also known as flip. Um, he's there being Ron Stallworth. And so they're both there at the same time. And just, he plays that for some laughs um, and some, Oh no, he didn't moments. <laughs> uh, it gets, I, I actually like that, that, yeah. uh, that moment quite a bit. Um, what a lot else? of good we tension in the room. <laughs> we don't need to recap the whole plot just to recap it. But um, again, I guess one of the other things is that Felix, who is one of the more uh, extreme and radical members of the KKK, he's going to try to bomb, um, what's your name? Uh, Patrice, who is mm-hmm. the uh, Black Student Union um, president and also Ron Stallworth's uh, girlfriend, um, it seems like at the time. Uh, and then there is a bomb that goes off. I guess we don't need to dance around anything, but it ends up actually uh, killing. Is it Felix himself who kills some of the KKK guys? Instead yeah, of- I think it was Felix himself. And it's his wife that goes to prison as a result of accidentally killing her own husband just because of the order of operations. Of She was trying to put the bomb in the mailbox of Patrice's house, but then couldn't do that. So then she put it out on the car. Um, but then the KKK came and pulled up to the car where the bomb was and didn't know that that was a change of plans. You know, there's no cell phones or anything. Um, and it's kind of tragic, but kind of kind of a Darwin Award-esque sort of um, <laughs> uh, uh, karma-infused sort of, you know, she was kind of, she was an interesting character too, trying to prove herself to her husband that she could help with the whole racist stuff that he had going on in the KKK. But then he ends up dying and she goes to prison for her life. Yeah. So, so yeah, that's most of the, the broad points, I guess, in terms of the plot. I, one thing I do want to give a big thumbs up to Spike Lee for is the tonal dynamics. I'm always a fan. Anyone who's listened to us knows that I love to praise that. But not only is it political, and it sometimes is political and maybe too much for my taste, but it's also playful and funny. Uh, I can get tragic and there are gut punches and it can make you queasy and squirmy. Um, and I still find it delicious that the Klansmen occasionally veer into being, you know, this close to being sympathetic. <laughs> sure, um, yeah. I just, I just like may, being made to feel all sorts of different kinds of ways in a movie, and uh, it really adds to it for me, and I think Spike Lee was terrific at that. Yeah, I'll co-sign that 100%. Totally agree, and uh, definite recommend. It's a, it's a good joint. It's a Spike Lee joint that I would enjoy and you should enjoy. <laughs> there we go. Anything else you wanted to get out there, Bob? Uh, I think that's it. I think we, we covered it. Uh, yeah. Um, oh, I had one more bullet point here. Uh, also has interesting themes. Uh, in addition to racism, code switching, the politics of police work and radical activism. Um, again, I like steer and clear politics, but this was in the movie. I just don't know if we're the, uh, the best to really comment on that, but it makes some good statements on all of those. Sure. So if you want to see that, I guess you could go see it instead of only listening to our spoiler cast. <laughs> yeah, that's right. This is one of those movies that we recommend. Maybe we should have said this up front, but uh, you should watch the movie and then have it spoiled for you or the other way around. Either way is fine, but uh, both are worthwhile because of the type of movie. But if you just want to spoiled, we're here for you. We're here for you. Yeah. <laughs> All right. right. Well, let's get to, let's get to our top five ish list here, Bob. And, Ooh, uh, fun. I feel like we have to sheepishly admit something. Sure. Uh, but I'm going to call it black politics movies of the last few years, just because I don't know if either of us are qualified to really extend it must pass the last few years. Um, but whatever we're going to, we're going to do that. It's just based on us. Maybe we should see more diverse array of movies than we do, but whatever, this is us. 
with that said, this is the definitive list of <laughs> black politics movies from the last. No, if we do this for fun, people. Uh, yeah, let's do this. This will be funny. So give us a break. And if it's flawed, it's us, but we can still have a good time. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to nominate Get Out. Um, I know you didn't like it because you're a bad person. You didn't like it as much as I did, but I think it's up there as a black politics movie of the last few years. Okay. Well, there we go. That, that's one. That's for sure. I'm going to go with 12 Years a Slave. Oh, that's good. I didn't reach far back enough because isn't that like, that's a few years. Sure. You're like five years or something. I don't remember the, the date. Few, I feel like few is vague enough. You could say 12 if you I'm want. I'm going to give it to you. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay, your turn. <laughs> well, I was going to go again more recent, uh, Black Panther. Um, indirectly about black politics or more directly, depends on how you read into it. But uh, yeah, it's, it was a fun movie and... I think it should be on the list. Sure. Yeah, it, it was on my list. I was going to nominate it, but lower. Because I think Black Klansman is actually above Black Panther. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. I, <laughs> I, I feel the same way. I'm sorry. <laughs> we're, we're still new at this. Uh, because this is the movie we were talking about, I, I, I forgot to put it on, on my list in the first place. But honestly, of all the movies I've said and the movies I'm still going to say, which aren't that many, Black Klansman is the best political black movie of the last few years so let the record be revisited i guess for that for bob okay sounds good um i'll count that black clansman is mine so okay go again if you want all right well now this is where i'm gonna say <laughs> the other side of the list i don't have any uh, any more that i could think of in the moment uh sorry to bother you is on this list but it's toward the bottom because i I think it's not that great of a movie, but it's something. <laughs> <laughs> the only other one I want to mention is Fruitvale Station. Oh, uh, I heard about that, but I didn't see it. Yeah. Which had uh, Jordan B. Peterson and about um, tragic, you know, death of, sure. a, of a black kid. Okay. So I think that's all. I counted one, two, three, four, five, six different ones then, I think. Yeah, that sounds good. All right. So this is... Well, what do you think? You, you want to put Black Klansman above 12 Years a Slave? I, I could be talked into that. Or no, no, under. I could be talked into under two. I think from a technicality perspective, the way I rank and rate these things, if I were to dig up my review, I think 12 Years a Slave is... Um, no, I think 12 Years a Slave is, is at the top. Yeah, I just didn't okay, think of that. That's fine. So I think... Uh, well, I'll let you, I'll let you uh, put Black Panther above Get Out. That's fine if you want. <laughs> okay, not that I loved Black Panther, but um, here is what I'm going to suggest. Okay. So see how you feel about this, Bob. Again, two um, white dudes <laughs> making the definitive... Just kidding. I'm <laughs> that word. Give us uh, a break. We're, we're having fun here. Yeah, Okay, exactly. so we're going to go 12 Years a Slave, Black Klansman, Fruitvale Station. Yeah? Okay, sure. Black Panther, Get Out. Sorry to bother you. Done and done. I and like Sorry to Bother that. You, maybe about the same as Get Out. So whatever, if you put Oh, it. wow. I like Get Out a lot more. <laughs> yeah, I know. Okay. All right. So there you go. That's the uh, top five-ish list of black politics movies of the last few years. <laughs> and uh, there you go. Black Klansman spoiled. And if you listened without watching it first, we hope you can now fake it fairly well in whatever social situations you may need to. And that is this episode of the Practically Culture Spoiler Cast. Join us next week as we spoil. Oh, we didn't talk. Probably Succession, yeah? Yeah, probably Succession. Let's go with that. And we'll have the usual top five-ish list and chat about what we're watching. You can find more from us at practicallyculture.com, on YouTube, and in your favorite podcast app. Like us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter. I'm at Logan Bo, Bob's at, Cas Bob's at Bob Caswell. <laughs> Send us a message. Ask us a question. Let us know how you like the show. Come back and get your pop culture spoiled. Thanks for rocking with us. Have a good one.